Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Welcome to Vox Novus, the new voice. I have openly shared on my podcasts, at meetings and conventions, with friends and family, and within my professional community of my UFO sightings and contact experiences that date back to my childhood in the 1950s. I was never concerned about ridicule or being believed because these were my personal valid experiences. Professionally, my sharing was often received with smirks, smiles, and eye-rolling, but it did not jeopardize my career or reputation. In retrospect, I was fortunate. What about those who are reticent to share these experiences because they fear ridicule, ostracizing, and loss of professional respect and standing? My guest this week on Vox Novus, Terry Lovelace, kept the secret of his alien abduction for many years for these very reasons. Terry is a six-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a law degree from Western Michigan. His legal career began in private practice until his appointment as an assistant attorney general for the U.S. Territory of American Samoa. He also served as an assistant attorney general for the state of Vermont until his retirement in 2012. He and a friend were abducted from Devil's Den State Park in northwest Arkansas in June of 1977 while camping. They were both on active duty at the time. In 2012, a routine leg x-ray discovered two anomalous objects in his leg. That event was the catalyst to write and speak publicly about his experiences. For fear of losing his position and the respect of his peers in the legal community, he waited until 2018 to self-publish Incident at Devil's Den, a number one highly reviewed bestseller on Amazon. His second book, Devil's Den, The Reckoning, was published the week of Christmas 2020. It was number one in new releases and hit bestseller status, ranking number four in early January. Since March 2018, he's been a radio podcast guest for more than 100 shows, including George Knapp, George Nury, Linda Moulton Howe, and Jimmy Church. He's spoken at the UFO Congress, Contact in the Desert, Roswell, and is a scheduled speaker at the Ozark Digital Conference set for April 2021 and Contact in the Desert, May of 2021. His story was featured on an episode of Travel Channel's My Horror Story, which originally aired in November 2019. His website is terrylovelace.com, and he joins me this week to share his story. Please welcome the Vox Novus, Terry Lovelace. Welcome, Terry. Thank you so much, Victor. I appreciate the kind introduction. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Now, before the show, we shared the synchronicity of our both serving in the United States Air Force from 1973 to 1979. And I want to thank you for your service. Well, and likewise. Thank you, sir. Now, please start by sharing with our listeners your early years before the Air Force and the experience you had in your youth. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, When I was... um, Four, between four and five are the earliest memories that I have. Um, I had memories of being taken aboard a, a ship, I assume, of some kind, someplace. And uh, it was a white room with a dome ceiling and a gray padded floor. And I would play with these other children that were there. And it was always the same group of kids. It was never the group that I knew from school or from the neighborhood. Um And uh, that happened, you know, episodically throughout my early years. And, um, you know, my my parents attributed that to imagination, you know, or a dream. Um, But I know certainly it wasn't a dream. I explained in in, in my first book, well, in my second book, too, I talk about how uh, I had these little figures that looked like, uh, and it sounds ridiculous, circus monkeys that would come into my room. And I believe, uh, you know, they were the ones that actually did the taking. You know, they were, they were 
you know, disguised in a way to look most benign to me, you know, because I saw them as kind of comedic, you know, I didn't see them as a threat, although I was afraid of them sometimes. Um, I didn't see them as a threat. You know, in the back of the incident at Devil's Den, I put an email address in the, in the epilogue of my book, and I said, you know, look, I'm not a psychiatrist or a doctor or anything, but, uh, you know, I would love to hear your story. If you've had an experience uh, and you'd like to share it with someone, you can share it with me in, in confidence, and uh, I'll answer every email. Well, so- I've got... Almost 1,500 emails. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So your parents labeled you with an overactive imagination. My parents labeled me with an overactive imagination. Perhaps we were together on one of those voyages. You know what? I would not doubt it. Because I'll <laughs> tell you, I, I'm sitting here looking at your photograph, and I can see uh, there is familiarity there. Absolutely. And I had the same impression of your photograph that we have met before, perhaps as children, perhaps in other times, but absolutely we've met before. Now, in the Air Force, what was your first duty station after training and what was your Air Force specialty code? I was a 90250, which was a a medic, a medical services specialist. Uh, I was trained as a medic and an EMT uh, and worked as a first responder. My entire enlistment I spent at Whiteman Air Force Base. Uh, it was a SAC base then with B-52s and Minutemen 2 ICBMs spread out all over the countryside because it was a remote base back then. There was there was nothing around but farmland. Uh, and today it's home to the B-2 bombers. So that's their one and only home. And how did you and your service friend Toby decide to go camping in Devil's Den State Park in Arkansas? You know, that's a really strange story. Um, You know, I'll emphasize that I was from St. Louis City and had never been camping in my life. My friend Toby was from Flint, Michigan, and had never been camping in his life. And he came to me one night. It was mid-April, I think. It wasn't wasn't great conditions to go yet. It wasn't, you know. But he came to me and says, hey, man, I got a great idea. Let's go camping. And I, I laughed and I said, what do we know about camping? You know, well, And where did this idea originate? And he says, well, you know, look, you you know, you're an amateur photographer. You got a nice camera. You like to take pictures. You can't, you know, you can't use it anywhere on base. He said, why don't we go down to the state park and, uh, you know, you can photograph eagles and wildlife. And uh, he says, I can uh, I can get a chance to watch the night sky without light pollution. Because he was he was fascinated with the night sky. And, And I regret that we never had the chance to have that conversation about the origin of that interest in the night sky. But yeah, he wanted to be an astronomer or a cosmologist. So, so what is yeah. some of the history of devil's den? Oh, you know, I, I researched devil's den pretty thoroughly back in uh, 2017 when I, when I wrote the bulk of the book and I, uh, to stay current, what I did was because I ran into the same problem David Pilates ran into. And that was that information about people that go missing, um, uh, wasn't available, you know, the the, uh, the Department of Parks uh, in Little Rock would not cooperate with my request. Uh, I followed up with a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request, and was told we, we don't have records, you know, we can't, they, they don't, we can't give you what doesn't exist. And uh, so I did some research. I found an article in the uh, Pittsburgh Press from 1946 about a little girl that, um, was there. She, her family was from Pittsburgh. They were headed to El Paso, spent the night uh, at Devil's Den. In 1946, there was a camping craze in the United States that year post-war. And uh, she was running around the camp or the morning of their first night. Uh, and the two, her two younger brothers came running around, but no, no Catherine. Catherine Van Alst was her name. She didn't pop out uh, with the two boys. And mom's like, boys, where's your sister? Well, that kicked off, uh, they couldn't find her, and it kicked off a weeks-long search that was going to transition from a rescue to a recovery on the seventh day. On the seventh day, a um, University of Arkansas student named Chadwick, Porter Chadwick, uh, was up on top of an elevated uh, a, a limestone precipice, a mini mountain, about 700 feet elevation, uh, and you get there through walking a zigzag trail, uh, and this would have been some six miles from the campsite. And this little girl 
was in a bathing suit and flip-flops when she disappeared. And he called out her name, and she walked out from underneath this limestone overcrop outcropping and said, here I am. And he broke down. He went over and he picks her up, swoops her up. And I said, my God, you okay? And other than a few bug bites, she was fine. What's curious is not only was she fine, she was well hydrated, despite the fact that there wasn't any potable water anywhere. She was well hydrated. She hadn't lost an ounce of weight. The mother said that her hair smelled clean, just like it did from her night bath the evening before. And uh, they ask her, well, where have you been, hon? And, and she says, I, I don't know. She says, I woke up up here and thought I'd just wait for you to come get me. Mm. So uh, I would love to have talked to her. I'd, I'd love to have found her and talked to her. But that was an opportunity lost. In your research, how many people went missing around Devil's Den? You know, I only found a few um, because, uh, again, I would have to, it would take an awful lot of time to spend in the Russellville, uh, Arkansas, and, and the surrounding communities in the little papers going through. Uh, I don't know of any way to do a fast search on that. Uh, mm -hmm. The Arkansas Gazette was very interested in my story and publicized it widely. And while I was uh, working on Devil's Den, in August of 2017, a young man from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, 32-year-old young man, went missing from the Butterfield Trail. Uh, he and a friend were walking across the trail, and uh, he realized he was having an asthma attack and said to his friend, I, I left my inhaler back in the car. Would you mind uh, running back for me? Friend says, sure, no problem. He friend runs back to the car, grabs the inhaler. He's back in 30 minutes, and there's no Rodney Letterman. All mm. there is is a telephone on the ground. Mm. And that was one of the catalysts to write the second book, because I promised readers, if anything ever, ever becomes of Rodney Letterman, I'll, I'll let you know the final disposition. Well, in March of 2019, there was a young couple walking up the Butterfield Trail, and the young woman said, to her friend, is that, a, is that an albino turtle? Uh, and they went over to investigate, and he picked it up and realized it was a, it was the very top of Rodney's skull, bleached mm. white in the sun, mm. and verified by the Bartlesville, Oklahoma medical examiner by DNA evidence as being Rodney Letterman's skull. And that's all they ever found. And what's curious is that this skull piece fragment was placed on a log on the trail in plain view. So it's almost like a message, almost, I don't know what the message would be. I don't think it would be good, um, but it, it was left there intentionally by someone. So, and Devil's it, Den had a reputation amongst the indigenous Americans, didn't it? Oh, my God, it did. And I was lucky enough to speak with a medicine woman uh, from the Cato or Cato tribe. She pronounces it Cato. I've heard it pronounced both ways. And... I asked her, can you tell me about Devil's Den? And she says, yes, I can tell you this, that our people consider it a place that we transit through only. You know, we'll cut across to get to point A to point B, but we won't hunt, camp, or fish there. And I said, well, why is that? And she says, because it's cursed ground. And I said, yeah, but how do you know that it's cursed? What's, what's the, where did the curse, curse originate? And she says, I have no idea. And she says, as long as my people have been around, that's been oral tradition. And we respect that tradition and observe it. And I followed up with an archaeologist, uh, a friend through a friend at Michigan State University, who told me that they found uh, Native American and Neolithic artifacts all around that park, uh, along with campsites and, and the like. But inside that uh, confines of Devil's Den, nothing. They've never found uh, anything. So you and Toby are planning this trip. Were you aware of any of this prior to going? No, absolutely not. Um, we were aware that um, a lot of people went and said it was a beautiful place and had a good time. And, uh, you know, we had it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. In retrospect, I looked at it and, uh, you know, we were in Nob Noster, Missouri. There was Nob Noster State Park, which was a beautiful state park across. the. It was across the street from the gate to, to the to the base. Uh Within within 10 miles, there were six nice parks we could have stayed in. Mm. But we tro chose to drive six and a half hours south, um, trespass onto some federal land that's carved out, 
and go to the top of this precipice, this not, not precipice, really a plateau, this piece of high ground. And uh, that's where we stayed. We didn't stay in a campground. So there was a calling, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we, you know, it had the feel like we were like we were keeping an appointment. It really did. And, you know, we, we were so inept in the execution of this thing. We were, we were spot on with the planning, but the execution, the wheels just fell off. And that wasn't, that wasn't us. That wasn't typical of us. We were more, way more competent than that. But uh, there were a series of mishaps I won't go into, including me leaving my camera at home. Mm. Uh, but, you know, my friend had a camera. My mm-hmm. friend had a camera in his bag. So, I mean, it, weren't like we, it wasn't like we were down there without a camera. But, you know, when we saw this thing, the idea of, a, of taking a picture of it never crossed our minds. And I think that speaks to the influence these things have on us. Because if you've ever known anyone who's an avid photographer, you know that anything that happens, they can't wait to get it on, on film, or digital or whatever. But, uh, yeah, thought, thought to take a picture of it never crossed our minds. Prior to that evening, what was it like on the trail? Uh, on, the, on the trip down? But yeah, prior to, the, prior to the actual evening of the event, what was it like? You know, it was mixed emotion. We, uh, we left the base feeling absolutely on top of the world. I mean, um, maybe even a little too too exuberant, you know. Uh, I mean, it was a camping trip, but it was uh, it had taken on some real importance for some reason. Was and there, halfway down, I realized I didn't have my camera. Was there a sense of foreboding at all? You know, when I couldn't find my camera, um, I had a nagging feeling that something's not right. Hmm. This is just not right. You know, I forgot. I borrowed a, a nice camp axe, a, a camp lantern, and a, and a gallon of fuel. I left that at home, too. My friend Toby, who's, who's reliable. I mean, we stocked an ambulance every night. I mean, this was, this was second nature to us. And, uh, you know, he left, he left, you know, beans, can opener. Um, you know, we ended up taking, we were going to take 10 cans of beer for two nights. And we ended up taking four because he forgot the other the mm. others mm. and um uh there was just a whole lot of things that were just um like i said we, we weren't that inept and then one evening everything changes what happened yeah that was our first evening there uh, we uh were we'd had we'd had actually a fun day you know done all the because it was all new to us and we, uh, about probably nine o'clock in the evening, we were sitting on air mattresses around a campfire, campfire between us, and uh, laughing and just kind of having a good time. And in a lull of our conversation, I noticed that all the crickets, the tree frogs, you know, all the, all the insects and things that make noise in the forest uh, that were loud enough that, that we had to raise our voices to be heard. Uh, and this sounds cliche, I know, but you know what? It, it's sure true. It fell silent, and it fell absolutely dead quiet. I mean, it was like being in a sound booth. Even the breeze that we'd enjoyed earlier had died. So there was there was there was nothing, and, and it unnerved me. It, it truly did. I was I was uh, frightened by it. Uh, but my friend wasn't phased. He's like, "No, nah, don't worry about it. you know bugs will come back. They'll be they'll, you just watch. They'll be back." Then he gets. Uh, he gets fixated on something to the west, to his left, and he asked me, hey, Terry, were those lights there before? And I took, stood up and took a step back, and I could see on the western horizon, above the horizon, there were a cluster of three bright stars. Uh, they were all the same brightness, same luminosity, and in a tight little triangle, and they looked artificial. They didn't look, you know, we thought maybe it could have been a plane that, but we knew we didn't know we knew a little bit about aircraft, but we didn't know of any plane that had that that tri three light configuration in the front. And uh, thought maybe maybe it's headed in our direction. That's why it doesn't appear to be moving. You know, as soon as it changes course by a degree or two, we'll be able to see that it's moving. And it never did. Uh, what it did do was it rotated like it were on an axis and rotated about 120 degrees and aligned the base of the triangle parallel with the horizon and it started to move up into the air. 
And that's when I noticed this sense of calm wash over me because mm-hmm. I had been progressive, getting progressively more and more fearful, you know, since the bugs stopped making noise and the breeze stopped, I'd been getting um, unnerved. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm in a very strange place. Uh, all fear left me. And I had this, I'd describe it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was apathetic, but I'd describe it as a mild disinterest. It felt like like an observer more than a participant in what was going on. And this thing reached the ceiling and then turned and glided down in our direction and did a couple somersaults, which were kind of interesting to see, a triangle doing these somersaults with the apex of the triangle pointed right at you, you know, at, at the campsite. And I had the feeling that, that that maybe was done for our benefit to let us know that, you know, it's not, this thing's not out of control. It's moving with intention. And it glided in and uh, at about 5,000 feet and then dropped as it approached us to about 3,000 feet and stopped at 3,000 feet right over the meadow where we had set up camp. Fortunately, we had set up camp kind of off to the side, so it wasn't right over our heads. And uh, with with that, we... Um, we saw some, some strange lights come down from this thing. Um, but then I felt this overwhelming uh, feeling of sleepy. And we shouldn't have been sleepy. We had every right to be tired, but not sleepy. I mean, we worked night the night shift for three years. This was, you know, morning for us. And um, we both went to bed. We both just, without hardly a word said, I think Toby said, show's over. Uh, we got up and we went and climbed in the tent and went to sleep. And I'm going to ask you to hold at that point. My guest today is Terry Lovelace. We're talking about his experiences that he details in his books, Incident at Devil's Den and Devil's Den, The Reckoning. Terry, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and this amazing story. Sure. My my website, I have some pictures and I have some interesting x-rays that were taken in 2012, uh, are at terrylovelace.com. My books are also available uh, only on Amazon. uh, And I have a web. Uh, pardon me, a Facebook page. I appreciate all visitors. It's uh, Incident at Devil's Den or Terry Lovelace. Uh, So stop by and visit me there. And we'll be back with more of Terry after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. The cutting edge of conscious radio. OM Times Radio. IOM FM. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Back on Box Novus, my guest this week is Terry Lovelace. He's the author of Incident at Devil's Den and Devil's Den, The Reckoning. So, Terry, you and Toby uh, were having this visual experience. You saw this craft. Uh, it was above you, and then you became very relaxed and calm, and the both of you basically went to sleep. What was the next thing you remember? The next thing I remembered was waking up with these flashing lights through the canvas of the tent, and they were bright. They were bright like a, like a you know, 1960s flash bulb you know, that would go off and you'd see blue or a dot every time you'd blink for an hour. Just real intense. And they were multiple colors, white, uh, yellow, and orange, and blinking at odd intervals. And I didn't have my wits about me. I mean, this woke me up, got my attention, and I'm like, where am I? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm camping. I'm here with Toby. That's right. And I sat up, and when I did, I noticed uh, that I was in pain, and I noticed that my boots had been unlaced almost all the way down. And that confused me. 
because, you know, I would never do that. And, and you know how they teach you to take care of your feet. If you can't walk, you're really not much use. And I would, you know, I, w- I would have taken my boots off. I would take, I would have left them on, but I wouldn't have done that. So I take them off and then I discover that my, my socks are on sideways. And that, that kind of, uh, more than puzzled me, that kind of, that kind of uh, alarmed me because it didn't make any sense. And my friend is peeking out of the flap of the tent on his side to my left, and he's fixated on something. And I'm reasoning that these flashes of light have to be like the overhead flashers of a park ranger's truck there to kick us out. That's That was my first thought, trying to put some kind of rational, you know, um, reason for it. And uh, I... I ask him, what's out there, Toby? Is that for park rangers? What are you looking at? And he kind of uh, told me to be quiet, and I got to my knees, kind of frustrated, and I looked, pulled back the flap of my tent, and what I saw was that this thing that had been, you know, probably 3,000 feet above our heads the night before had descended, and now is just about 30 feet over the meadow, and we're just offset by it, by maybe 10 feet. So it wasn't over our heads, thank God. It was it was offset just a bit because we had tri- we had camped on the edge, uh, curiously at a spot that Toby insisted that we that we camp at. Um, and the second thing that I noticed was what I first thought to be a group of kids. Now we're we're a fair distance away from them because this thing is is immense. It's a city block on each length of the leg of the triangle is a city block long. And I'm uh, I'm looking, and in these flashes of light I saw, like I said, what appeared to be maybe a dozen, maybe 15, I didn't count them, children. And I asked Toby, I said, Toby, man, what are these kids doing out here in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere? And he said, Terry, man, those ain't no little kids. Look at them. They're not human beings. Don't you remember? They took us and they hurt us. And when he said that, that hit me like a slap in the face. And I had, I've never had a clear linear memory of what happened to us. Um, but I had fragments pop into my mind um, of, of, of being inside this thing. And that's when my fear level went, you know, over the top. I was absolutely terrified. And I was scared to death. One of us were going to cough or sneeze and get these little guys interested in us, and they'd come, you know, come over to our tent and do God knows what. But you know, we had no way to know they were long done with us. You know, <laughs> we weren't we weren't on the uh, on their agenda anymore. And uh, while we watched, this light came on, uh, and it was weird. It was a column of visible white light that came on from underneath this thing, dead center. And it was about as wide as it was, as the thing was tall off the meadow. So about 30 feet wide, 30 feet tall. And as soon as that clicked on, all of these little guys turned their attention and their bodies toward this light and started walking toward it. Uh, Not in a hurry, but but just walking in that direction. And they had a unique gait. They they walked really with a strange walk. It, It was like their legs were hinged to go backward an inch with each step. It looked awkward. I don't know how to, how else to describe it. And these two, these little guys are all paired up in twos well, and threes and they would walk into this light. And when they did within a few seconds, they would just pixelate out and dissolve and be gone. And we watched this, uh, over a span of about 15 minutes and the last two little guys were gone. And when they were gone, the uh, the lights on the points of the triangle, we could only see two lights, of course, um, changed from multicolored to just white. And uh, the, um, the light turned off. And there had been kind of a low drone, droning mechanical type noise. And that, that abruptly stopped. And we watched this thing take off. And it didn't take off like a rocket ship. It just it lifted off like a hot air balloon and rotated a little bit and went straight up. And it was three lights and then one light and then gone. And we sat there for 30 minutes. We were too afraid to 
you know, it, it doesn't make sense. All it was was a piece of canvas over my head, but I felt like I had cover. I felt like uh, I didn't want to be vulnerable and exposed. And, you know, to this day, I will not walk across an open field by myself. I'll walk a mile and a half around, but I won't, I won't cut across an open field. And um, we eventually, I grabbed my wallet and keys, and Toby grabbed a flashlight in his wallet, and we darted to the car. And we left everything there. We left Toby's backpack, his nice Coleman cooler, our tent, everything. We left everything there. Um, and that's, that's how I think that they found us. Cause I think the park rangers found Toby's backpack. Both of us were NCOs living in family housing. We were married and living on base just a few blocks from one another. So when they found Toby's backpack, they called the base and said, Hey, it looks like two of your airmen are down here. And it looks like they got a little campsite set up and are planning on coming back. Um, so, and of course that wasn't the case at all. And when we got back, we were, we were hurt. We both, uh, I had the worst sunburn I'd ever had in my life, and I didn't spend any time in the sun. Um, and I was sunburned on every square inch of my body, soles of my feet, my hair, under my arms, I mean everywhere, and I, I wasn't out in the sun, certainly not even without my, with a shirt off. And uh, the second thing that was most painful, what we, and we were both terribly dehydrated, absolutely, just worst thirst I've ever experienced. And uh, we both had flash burns to our eyes, you know, like a, like a welder would get if he didn't use that hood to shield his, his vision. And so it's a sunburn to the corner of your eye. Yes. And it's very painful. It feels like you have sand in your eyes. I've and had it, I know. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. It's I know. Terrible. So you both are airmen. I was in the Air Force. And... I know that if I had started sharing any of what you folks experienced with my superior officers, they probably would have locked me up or told me to shut up and don't talk about it again. Did you and Toby have any discussion as to what you would share or say to your superiors or anyone? We did. We did. We had an agreement. And um, we didn't want to lie. That was important to us. You know, we wanted to tell the truth. So... But we didn't want to tell them that we saw a UFO the size of Walmart because uh, you're right. We would have been, you know, maybe a psych eval. Uh, bad things would have happened. I mean, it, it, for sure, whatever would have happened wouldn't have been good. So we agreed that uh, we would not speak a word about what we saw. Uh, we would say that we went to bed feeling funny, got up the next morning sick as dogs, um, and we're so sick we just hopped in the car and left. We didn't care about our $10 Kmart tent. We just wanted to go home. Mm. Yeah. And, and that was our story. We're going to discuss your experiences after this event. But first, please tell us what happened to Toby. Oh, Toby, my friend. You know, it, understand that when we left, we went down to Devil's Den really like two teenagers. You know, uh, I, I was 22. He was 23. But we were kids, really. And uh, when we left, we were, we were adults, and something had changed um, in our relationship. Here we were the best of friends. Our wives were best of friends. We worked together. We socialized together. We played cards. Uh, we barbecued on the days off. We, um, we had a lot of common interests. And, uh, you know, um, I wanted nothing to do with the guy. And I couldn't reconcile that emotion. Mm. And I, I can't reconcile it now. Uh, all I can say is that, you know, whatever influence we were under from that thing, I think did not want us um, to get our stories together. The Air Force certainly didn't want us to get our stories together. Um, you know, because it, it makes sense, I guess, if you look at it objectively, two stories um, from two objective observers who had clean record, weren't drinkers, weren't the road druggies, weren't, you know, we were kept our nose clean. We were, we were, uh, we were the good guys. Uh, why wouldn't they believe us? Um, but we knew they wouldn't. So. And tragically, Toby did not live long, right? You know, Toby lived longer than I sure thought. Um, there's a story behind that real quick. And what had happened was, um, 
I saw him one last time. I stopped by the house. We had been ordered by the OSI. Uh, for those in the audience who might not know, the Air Force has an investigative branch called the Office of Special Investigation. OSI kind of is to the Air Force what NCIS is to the Navy, if that makes right. sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, the OSI informed us that um, – actually, the OSI didn't inform us. Uh, my, the squadron commander – the base commander and two guys in civilian clothes came into the hospital when I was in the hospital and told me you're to have no contact. It kind of, he kind of was very formal and, uh, uh, gave me an order very much like a, like a personal protection order would sound today. You're to have no contact in person, you know, via telephone through third parties. You're not to pass notes. He's not to give you anything. You're not to give him anything on and on. You know, the, you know how it goes. Um, so they wanted us to have no contact with one another. And I didn't understand that, but I was in a frame of mind where I thought, you know, that's fine. I, I, that's fine. I can live with that. And I stopped by, but I had this compulsion to see him one last time. And I thought that if I did in some way, that would bring me some measure of closure and help me to, you know, process this thing. So I swung by his house one last time. And because uh, they were packing, they cut orders. He was PCS to Japan. I mean, at light speed, they got him out. Um, and uh, I stopped by the house, walked up, same door I'd walked through a hundred times in my life, knocked on the door, opened it like I always did, said, hey, guys, it's me. And uh, stepped in and um, Toby's wife, Tammy, walked by me and scowled at me and said, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, hey, I know, I know. I said, I'm not here for a confrontation. I just want to wish you guys well. I heard you're going to Japan. And Toby heard me. He was in the bedroom, and he came out of the bedroom around the corner in the hall, and uh, he was a train wreck. He was one of these guys. He was always so particular about his appearance. You know, he was a guy that always had his shoes shined, his hair cut. You know, he always had his uh, uniform neatly starched. I was kind of the slob of the duo, but uh, – but he was always so meticulous with his appearance, and he just looked like a train wreck. I mean, I understand he was moving, but his shirt was filthy. He wore dirty pants. He was barefoot, unshaven, and I'd, I'd never seen him like that. And when I saw him, uh, I didn't feel I, – I went in there thinking I would embrace the guy, that that would be appropriate, and say, man, it's been good working with you. You know, you, know, you, you and Tammy got to stay in touch. You know, this thing will blow over. Uh, but it didn't work that way. When I saw him, I felt uh, I felt like I wanted to turn around and run out of the house. Mm. And he walked up to me, and he was a little shorter than I am. And he looked up at me, and we tried to exchange a handshake. I held my hand, and we missed each other. And finally, and made this inelegant handshake thing. And he looked up at me, and he said, "All he said was, it happened, didn't it, Terry?" And I said, yes, my brother, it really happened. You're not losing your mind. And he said, but why us? Mm -hmm. And when he said that, I felt stunned. I, that, I broke my gaze with him. I looked down at my shoes. And I said, I said, man, I don't have an expletive clue. And I ran out of the house. And it's the last time I saw him. Um, now, some years later, we hooked up with Tammy who left Toby and divorced him. She got custody of the kids, and we got the whole story. Uh, she came to visit us up in Michigan. She was married, remarried to a long-haul truck driver who was taking a load to Detroit, would be near uh, where we lived, and wanted to stop by and catch up, show us pictures of the kids, and, you know, we had a child by that time. So we did, and she told me that Toby uh, had a problem with alcohol. She said he didn't drink so much during the day, but she said he could not go to sleep at night. Um, he would start drinking an hour, two hours before bed, and he would just pound vodka until he could, would pass out. And that was the only way he could sleep. Mm. I'm sure if you do that long enough that, uh, you know, it's going to deny you of REM sleep and, and have all kinds of health results. Um, but, yeah, and, and, you know, I could kind of understand you know, I had my struggles, too. Uh, not to his extent, thank God, but um, I sleep with a light on still, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Toby was, uh, I had a, a contact 
who was a federal agent. And uh, uh, I, wa- I want to make clear that I have nothing but the most, I have nothing but respect for law enforcement. I am pro law enforcement. I work with those guys. I was a prosecutor. You know, we worked hand in hand. I knew them, especially at that level, to be very good people. And I asked this agent if he could help me find my friend. And a week and a half later, uh, he met me after work. Uh, this bar we went through to have, have a beer on Friday nights, and uh, he told me that my friend had, been, had died. Mm. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense. He's a young man. How could he be dead? He says, look, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, he said, Terry, you've been around the block. You know this happens. Um, people die. And he said, your friend was involved in an automobile accident. It was a lane crossover, head-end type arrangement, and, uh, and he was deceased. And I thought, wow. And he says, you know, but, you know, you got to process it, move on with your life. And I took that to heart. And I so easily could have called Michigan State Police um, and, and verified that. And I never thought to do that. And I found out later in 2017 when I was working on this book that uh, I went to look up his obit and I couldn't find it. So I finally found it. He was alive until September 4th, 2007. Mm. So I had been misinformed. Mm. So. Deliberately, I, apparently. I think deliberately. Yeah. I mean, I, I I always knew these people to be stand-up guys, and, and but I think I think it may have been out of his out of his hands. I think maybe there's a file that says these guys aren't aren't to get together. Um, you know, absolutely. Take the story to the National Enquirer. That can't happen. My guest is Terry Lovelace. In our next segment, we're going to tell you, we're going to bring you the con- sort of the conclusion, the conclusion at this point, at least in terms of the story, of what happened to him in 2012. We'll be back with more after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. And together, we can discover what's really going on. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week is Terry Lovelace. We're talking about his experiences that he detailed in two books, Incident at Devil's Den and Devil's Den, The Reckoning. So that all happened in 1977, your experience. You jump ahead to 1987, you had a lost time experience. Your life was plagued with a series of nightmares. Uh, You and your wife, Sheila, went into a bookstore one day, and you saw something and had a negative reaction, and it turned out to be a picture of an alien on the cover of a book. Uh, So all of these things were happening. You had been a lifelong runner. You loved running, and you ran several miles almost every day. And on one of these runs, you felt something. What was that like? That was actually 1980, and I was on – I had to work my way up, you know, because I started doing uh, half a mile, then a mile, mile and a half, and uh, worked my way up to two miles. And I noticed that as soon as I'd hit the two-mile mark in my run, uh, there was a spot on my right leg, right above my knee and lateral to the right, that would go completely numb. Numb and kind of itchy, uh, weird sensation. But it happened every time, I mean, give or take 50 yards, that I do my run when I was at that two-mile mark. 
And that persisted throughout my lifetime every single time I ran. And then in uh, October, I, I retired from the state of Vermont in, uh, in January of uh, 2012, moved to Dallas where our children are, and um, our adult children are. And uh, in October of that year, I went to the hospital. I got all my medical care from the VA. And um, they took a f X-ray of my leg. The X-rays are on, on at uh, TerryLovelace.com. You can see them. Uh, they discovered two uh, what they refer to as anomalous structures in my leg. There's a thing above my knee that looks like an electrical device that has two wires attached, and that's deep in my fascia. It's down. It's deeper than it looks. I'll put it that way. Um, and you don't need a medical degree to see this. Uh, it, it's plain as day. And below my knee, in the calf of my leg, uh, there's a cluster, a floret pattern of um, what looks like Tic Tacs or something. And the radiologist came in uh, and looked at them while I was there because they thought they were interesting enough that the radiologist should come down and see them. Because normal routine is that, you know, they sit in a stack to be read a week later. Um, but he came down to look at my x-rays. And uh, he was visibly shaken because, uh, number one, he said there should be a scar on your leg where this thing entered your leg, and there, there wasn't. And he said, secondly, he said, as for the things below your leg, he said, on x-ray film, I can tell that they're the same density as bone tissue. But he said, I, I've never in my life seen bone tissue sprout in the middle of a muscle, much less arrange itself in a, in a symmetrical pattern. And his diagnosis was abnormal knee. <laughs> mm. Uh, that wasn't the cause of my pain. I had leg pain, but that was caused by a baker cyst, totally unrelated to the things in my leg. Uh, but seeing those things in my leg was um, triggered uh, an uptick in the nightmares. I would have terrible nightmares uh, once or twice a year. And um, seeing this validated that these things had put their hands on me. As soon as I saw them, I, I knew that... That was, you know, 1977 or before. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah that, that was upsetting and that was um, difficult for me to, to get through. And that was finally um, the impulse to write the book, the compulsion to write the book. Why did you not have these things removed? Two reasons. Um, well, one big reason, and that is I had a, a heart attack in 2005 and then I had a second in 2011. I had a, a quadruple bypass, a pacemaker, and uh, then I had a stent. Um, but I have, I have cardiac, I have heart disease. And uh, the surgeon saw the x-rays and was thrilled. He's like, oh, yeah, I'd love to take these out. And I was real <laughs> funny. I said, you know, <laughs> he was excited. And I said, you know, I, I have to insist on a, on a forensic protocol. He says, yeah, yeah, I've taken bullets out. I know you want a chain of custody. And I said, yeah, I, I, I do, establish chain of custody. I'll have someone, please, in the operating room that can accept them from you uh, so there's no doubt that they were switched or, or whatever and uh, preserve the integrity of the evidence. And um, he said, sure. He says, just get me. He said, I see you got a cardiac history, though. He says, you got to get me a cardiac clearance letter. And cardiologists view this as a risk versus benefit analysis. And cardiologists I saw told me, look, uh, you know, uh, the risk of infection, the risk of anesthesia uh, is not worth the benefit. He says, she, she said, these things are benign in your system. Uh, it doesn't make sense to take them out. And I said, yeah, but they're, they're tied to bad memories and I want them out. And she said, look, I got, you know, I got 500,000 veterans out there that have, you know, shrapnel in their bodies. They really want out, too. Um, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. If we did that, we'd be in the operating room all day long doing, mm. doing this without any real benefit but risk to the patient. And she said it's the standard of care in this country. Absolutely. Well, and I had to see five other cardiologists to get that confirmed, three in the VA and two that I paid for myself in the civilian world. And... Uh, Got the same answer. Now, through popular culture, everyone's familiar with the men in black. But in October of 2017, you received a visit from a woman in black. What happened? I did. And, I, and I'll, you should know that that's the second time that I saw her as an adult. Um, I saw her 
Um, you're talking about the event in in October 2017. Yes, Betty. Betty. I woke up in my living room, uh, sitting upright in my chair where I normally sit. And I opened my eyes and I was confused because I've, I, I've never sleepwalked. I've never done that in my life. And I've never... I've never woken up someplace and not known how I got there. And I I woke up and I felt that same sedated feeling of calm. Um, same thing that they did, that influence they had uh, in 1977. I wasn't excited. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, much of anything other than uh, docile and uh, seated directly across from me is what looks like a petite Asian woman. And she is wearing a cotton blouse with long sleeves with four ugly fingers sticking out. And um, black slacks, black shoes, red scarf tied around her pencil thin neck. Uh, But she's seated with her legs crossed and she's seated in a non-threatening posture. And I didn't feel threatened by her. And I glance at the alarm and the, the alarm is set. Uh, so she's not an intruder in, in that sense of the word. She hasn't broken into the home, and she looked familiar. And in what did home. she? What did she tell you? What did she warn you? She warned me that if I that if I go and tell my story, my government would not would not like it and would likely retaliate against me. And um, what else? That if I spoke about this event openly and if I wrote about it, that quote her host. H-O-S-T-S, host, would come and remove the object above my leg because she said that one cannot fall into the hands of terrestrial scientists. And a month later, November 2017, you experienced pain. You had your leg x-rayed one more time. What happened? Yeah, I woke up with terrible pain above my leg and two puncture marks, one one on each leg at the top. And I, I... told my wife, I said, they came and they got their stuff out of my leg. And she says, well, you got to get an x-ray. I said, I know. And, uh, my, you know, my mind's racing. How do I get an x-ray? Because you can't just order one up. And uh, I ended up, I went to a chiropractor's office. But I took photocopies of my x-rays showing the objects on copy paper with me when I went. And I waited to see the guy. I finally got to see him. And uh, he said, where do you hurt? And I uh, took my pants down and showed him the puncture wound. And he said, well, have you been in an accident or were you in a car accident? What happened to you? And I said, I don't know. I woke up like this. But I said, doctor, I'm going to be real candid to you because you're busy. And and I'm short on time, too. I had some alien implants in my leg. And I think they came and took them out last night. And I need an x-ray to confirm that. And uh, I put my pants back. As I'm doing my pants, he, he grabs me by the elbow and is escorting me to the front door saying, I'm sorry, I don't think we can help you. And uh, But I knew I knew these guys look at 100 x-rays a week. So as he's walking me to the front door, I held these pieces of paper up in front of his face, and he stopped, and he says, wait a minute, c- come on back. And we went into his office, and he shut the door, and uh, you know the phone is ringing, and people are knocking at the door, and uh, he ignores them. He looks, at the t- he looks at these two images, and he sets them down on his desk. I'm seated in front of him, and he says, tell me about this, but give me the capsule version. So I, I did. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to I'm gonna get, get, write you a script for an X-ray. Write you a, he said, I don't have X-ray equipment on site. He said, we use a freestanding clinic. It's you know a mile down the road. Um, and he said, I'll, I'll pay for your X-ray. I'll uh, even read it for you. Uh, but I ask one favor of you, that you don't use my name or the name of my clinic. And I promised him I wouldn't. He got the x-rays, and the x-rays, I, lo- I looked at the x-rays in the car, and the x-rays showed that the thing above my leg that looked like a uh, electronic device of some kind was gone. Mm. The things below my leg, they're still there. They're there today. Mm. Uh, still intact. In, in uh, retrospect, why do you think you were chosen for these life-changing experiences? God, I wish I knew. You know, and it's... It's kind of the same. It's kind of the same uh, thing that Toby asked me. Yeah, but why us? And I mean, um, I think this probably resonates with you on some level. That you know, I think we're chosen as uh, as children. There's a a woman you may be familiar with, Yvonne Smith, who's done hypnotic regression of, of uh, people that have had experiences for thirty years. 
And the name of her book is called Chosen. And um, she's come to conclude that after talking to so many people under hypnosis, um, that people have these experiences, usually not just once or twice, but list, exist, you know, throughout their lifetime, they have these experiences. And um, so I think, like, like she said in her book, you know, we're, we're chosen for whatever reason. For whatever reason. My guest, Terry Lovelace, his books are an amazing read. You have to get them. Terry, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you. Yes. Uh, I have a website, uh, terrylovelace.com, and you can go there and see the x-rays. You can also see I I hand drew a picture of what we saw that night, um, and that was drawn contemporaneous with the event. I drew it as soon as we got back. Um, And... uh, my books are on Amazon, uh, Incident at Devil's Den and Devil's Den, The Reckoning. I also have a web, or pardon me, a Facebook page under Incident at Devil's Den uh, and under Terry Lovelace, too. And you're welcome to visit me there. Uh, I have, you can email me if you'd like. My email address is easy, terrylovelace.com, uh, pardon me, terrylovelace at yahoo.com. Terry, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this truly fascinating story. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for joining us on Vox Novus. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. 